Welcome to Center Court. Hi, this is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. You are here for our MBA careers panel with four great schools. Uh, let me introduce all of our uh, participants here today. Uh, from Florida, Warrington, we have Carly Eskew, the Director of Graduate Business Career Services. From Notre Dame, Mendoza, we have Mary Coughlin, the Director of Career Coaching and Development. From Ohio State Fisher, we have Kevin Hardy, the Executive Director of the Office of Career Management. And from Georgia Tech, Scheller, we have Carolyn Player, the MBA Corporate Relations Manager. Welcome all. We're, we're talking about where can an MBA take your career? <clears throat> and before we get into the real nitty gritty uh, of the answers to that question, I want to have each of our panelists just give a general introduction to the school, its mission, its values, its reputation, and what it's best known for. Carolyn, let's start with you. Sure. So we like to say often that Georgia Tech Scheller exists at the intersection of business and technology. Um, here at Scheller College, we strive to, just to paraphrase the um, mission a bit, strive to cultivate ethical, tech-savvy, business-smart leaders uh, from a wide variety of backgrounds. We want these people to create value and solve problems in an increasing, increasingly technology-driven world. Um, our programs are known for emphasizing business analytics, um, driving innovation through an entrepreneurial mindset, and leveraging technology to transform companies and, and industries. Um, we also are very interested or invested in um, the, the creation or the um, amplification of sustainable business and community. Great. Okay, Kevin, Ohio State Fisher. Yes, yeah, so Ohio State Fisher is about principled leadership. That is our mission of, of what we're trying to accomplish and the students in which that we're trying to produce. Students that come here, we are educating them with integrity, empathy, educating them on embracing diversity and differences, building a community and an inclusive community with that, including social responsibility and nurturing creativity. One of the big things about OSU Fisher is the over million dollar, the million people that live in the greater Columbus area, as well as what I would call often the monster that is the Ohio State University uh, and the rabid fan base that is clearly a global brand of people that are connecting with these people, uh, with our alums, and the students have that opportunity. So the thing that we focus on or our areas are the flexibility within our curriculum. And those two areas of specialty tend to be consulting and financial, financial management, those key areas. Terrific. Mary, what about Notre Dame Mendoza? I mean, he, he was talking about Ohio State and that, that big community. I'll, I'll bring it right back to South Bend, Indiana for, for a similar take with that, that powerhouse of a community. But Notre Dame's uh, Mendoza College of Business, our, our mission is to grow the good in business. And so we really, from, from Notre Dame as a broader community, um, was founded on the principle of the university being a powerful force for good. And the business school sees our role as using commerce as a force for good. So within that grow the good in business uh, mission and mindset, it comes into the classroom learning where we have four key career pathways that really focus all of our academia and experiential learning within consulting, finance, technology, and marketing. And like I mentioned, it, it permeates across uh, academic experiences within the classroom but also experiential opportunities. We have a variety of students that are going out uh, both domestically and internationally next week to consult with companies kind of outside of, of the four walls of the business school. Uh, and in addition to those experiences, another key hallmark of our program is just that strength of the alumni network. Uh, so continuing to grow the good in business after you have left Mendoza. Now for both Mary and Kevin, I wanna ask you a question before I get to Carly. Uh, that I was asked just uh, an hour or two ago, how does a business school teach good intent? Since both of you raised the prospect of, um, you know, basically inculcating in students uh, a desire to do good in the world. Kevin, you want to take that? 
Yeah, it's a great question. And one of the things that we have done is, you know, trying to incorporate integrity and ethics. And it's something that's embedded in every part of our classes. It's so embedded that years ago we had done a survey and the survey when we asked the students about ethics and integrity on a specific class that was being taught, students said, uh, why are we taking this class? We're touching on integrity and ethics and business at every single class that we have. They're included in the syllabi that faculty are teaching from. It's those sort of not so subtle, but subtle points that we're coaching and teaching students about every day in terms of integrity and uh, ethics. And Mary, because you're at a Jesuit institution, I know that as you pointed out, ethics has been a core part of the Mendoza MBA for many, many years. Uh, I'm assuming that you embed this topic in across all your courses as well. Yes, and we're actually a, a Holy Cross institution, and our, our founders from Holy Cross really had that that mindset. One of the the core components before we even start classes is a uh, a curriculum that we have that is called Tender, Strong, and True. If you've heard the Notre Dame alma mater talks about Notre Dame, tender, strong, and true. And that's a core foundational kind of leadership uh, launching way for our students to learn about how to think about ethics, leadership, and integrity. And what's really a great part of this too is the the focus on learning about it within groups and, and holding each other up to that standard of integrity. One, to take that with them throughout the business school curriculum, but two, how to think about upholding integrity with, with your future partners within business. So that's a key launching pad for, for how we speak about integrity in the school. Great. Carly, at Florida, Florida Warrington, one of the things I immediately associate with your school is the flexibility in your several MBA programs. Why don't you describe that and tell me what uh, your mission or your focus has, has been? Sure. So starting with the mission, uh, formally, uh, Warrington's intent is to build a better society through creating meaningful research and educating tomorrow's business leaders. Drilling that down into the MBA, um, one of our taglines is, is transformation guaranteed. And I think we live that out. Um, there aren't many guarantees in this world. And certainly we, we make sure that students are putting in their part. But we think that we have a program around a variety of different MBA formats, as you've mentioned, John, that really give them the tools they need to succeed. And many of them are seeking dramatic transformations in their career. Um, we have an online program, a weekend program, a program in South Florida. Uh, we have an executive MBA program, and we, of course, have our full-time program on campus where we offer both one and two-year formats. So you're right. Um, if, if there's an uh, MBA uh, flavor that you're interested in, yeah, if there's an MBA flavor you're interested in, Warrington probably brings it to the table. But uh, when it comes to the full-time uh, program, we have a, a really small and curated class. Um, I think what sets us apart is our career focus. Uh, really from the beginning. So we're formally involved in the admissions process from that first round interview uh, and talk pretty closely with students about what their goals are. Um, that small cohort size allows our students to get really close to the professors as well. Um, and then I would just add that the team mindset at UF, it, it is what you would expect from, from an SEC school and, and one that was at least historically competitive in um, some of our more prominent sports teams. But our, our students really uh, bind together during the recruitment process, which is really fun to watch uh, them support each other. I've seen that a lot recently at career fairs. Uh, but that plays out later in the year and experiential learning opportunities as well through case competitions and, and other similar exercises exercises. And then similar to what was already mentioned, yeah, we uh, we have an alumni base. Kevin, did you say a rabid alumni base? I've never heard that, but I <laughs> I, I tend to align uh, with the sentiment there. And then also a similar range of concentrations that others have mentioned. So I think that's kind of, that gives you a good um, insight into what our MBA programs are about here at Warrington. Did you say rabid, Kevin? Was that right? I, I did. And it was, I'm, not, I'm not even sure it adequately uh, uh, describes the passion of, of some <laughs> of these folks. I, I have seen multiple places that uh, the number one college football most popular team is the Ohio State Buckeyes. And 
in this area. It's about, and I, I know that we got some football schools on here, so I, I want to be careful, but it's, uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it, it's, it's pretty passionate. Cool. Awesome. So, you know, for those of you out there who are thinking about getting an MBA uh, or any graduate degree in business, uh, there's one point I really want you to go away with. You know, unlike every other school and every other department in the university, the business school is the place where when you're handed that piece of parchment, when you graduate, the school does not consider its job done. Uh, the job is done when you get a job that you want. Uh, and even then, as an alum, most of the schools will help you and take care of you uh, throughout your entire career. And everyone on the panel today is involved in that process. So I, I want each of you to answer the very simple question, which is, which is what this whole thing is about. Where can an MBA take your career? Carly, what do you think? Thanks for starting with me uh, on this one. This is one we're really passionate about. So um, at UF, uh, our MBA students each year land in a pretty wide array of industries. So we're not a school that you come to if you want this particular industry or that one. We seek to admit really uh, sharp and driven candidates and help to get them connected to the places that they want to be. So this last year, that means that our top industries were consulting in CPG. But interestingly, after that, we had a spike in manufacturing placements. And I think that's just because some companies came around with some pretty strong needs, some pretty compelling programs that our students um, seize. So uh, every year we, we see uh, shifts in what our top industries are. So I'm actually proud to say that we aren't uh, one that really specializes and, and make sure we you know put most of our students in one industry over another. Um, but rather we, we sort of follow the needs of, of what the students and the desires of what the students uh, bring to the table. Fortunately, John, uh, every year we um, try to get a lot of our admits to the uh, networking festival and and, and I think they're coming in with better and better idea of the types of companies that they want to work for as a result. But I guess the summary is, um, I think at UF, we do a really good job of figuring out where the students want to be and responding to that versus, you know, we're strong in XYZ industry placement. And, and if you come here, we sort of expect you to, to do that. Right. The other thing, Carly, is demand for MBA talent is remain strong. Uh, the starting salaries are at record levels. Um, employers tend to love MBA students because they know that when they're hired, they can immediately make a difference in the world of work. It's not like you come in and then for three to six months, we'll teach you what to do. MBAs tend to know what to do from day one, and that makes a very big difference, right? Absolutely. I think that describes the uh, placement and roles of a lot of our students who, even though they're career switchers, um, they're handed the keys to the castle pretty early on. And there might be a week or two of imposter syndrome, but we think that our degree <laughs> and our experiential learning equips them with what they need to make that happen. Mary, where can a Mendoza MBA uh, take one's career? Yes, absolutely. So uh, as we, as I mentioned earlier, we have a, a pathway framework that helps to kind of guide how we st structure our academics and experiential learning, but students can really, really land outside of those. And like I mentioned before, our finance, consulting, technology, and marketing, where we are really intentional about making sure that there's an ecosystem kind of structure around those four categories to make sure there are strong resources, but also areas for exploration outside of that. And I, I want to focus in, I know consulting and finance are, are typically pretty strong placement areas across the MBA marketplace, but also right. looking at something like a technology and a marketing, you might think, hey, one of these is a function and one of these is an in industry, but also there are technology functions within companies. And so we really stress to students to not just think within those traditional, like, I need to go to a FANG company to be a, a technology innovator, something along those lines. We have product managers at Walmart e-commerce doing a tech function in a historically uh, kind of traditional industry. So I'd say those are our four kind of 
core categories where we see students and we ensure that we have a really robust system around those. But we also encourage students to think about that, that next generation of work. Every company could be a tech company. How do you think about bringing in ethics and sustainability into your function and your industry? So that, that's uh, the kind of the key categories, but with innovation beyond that. True. And Kevin, I think in, to some degree, the MBA has become almost an all-purpose degree. You have people who are using it to enter all different fields, including healthcare and sustainability, as mentioned by Mary. But uh, even in nonprofit roles, government roles, educational roles, uh, yes, the people who enter these fields are a minority compared to those who go into consulting, finance, and tech. Uh, but nonetheless, the diversity of careers is amazing, right? Well, you you literally cued me up perfectly, John. And <laughs> where can the MBA take you? Yeah. And I think you know there there are a few few times in your life when many times people do their undergraduate degree. And my mom was a teacher, my dad was an accountant, and they they go through a path, and they get through an undergraduate degree, and they're like, I, I'm I'm just going to continue to finish it. And all of a sudden they get, you know, a few years out and they're exploring and they're thinking, and is this what I'm going to do for the rest of my life? And that MBA is that opportunity for them to really think and explore and take the time to look at great programs like we have here on this call and see what might be the best fit for them in terms of what program is the best for them very similar to where they'll be looking for what job or industry or profession might be the best for them and trying to find that right that right fit. And I think that the MBA that I share with our students is I don't want you to be so focused on, hey, I need to go down this path or that path. It, it's more of let's take the time and get you to the right place. And for us in the Fisher College of Business, those four areas that we tend to see a lot of people are in is supply chain, finance, right. consulting, and marketing. But we are open to some of the areas that you just said, John, of healthcare. And while some of those areas are nonprofits, are a bit more of the minority, it's the time that we want to spend with the students here and helping them explore what might be that next career path so that they've had time to assess and start heading in the right direction with for what we hope will be a 30 to 40 year career. Yep. Uh, Caroline, tell me a little bit about the graduates of your program and what they end up doing. Sure, I they're capable problem solvers. If I had to tag a, a kind of a title around what who I think they are and collaborators. I think we really build that into the culture of our program, that they are cooperating with one another, building relationships. As Carly mentioned, we have a relatively small full-time program, particularly. We have several, several different formats, but I do think that that small um, cohort really helps to shape the relationships they have with one another, and it also helps to shape the relationships we're able to have as career advisors with the students. Um, and as Kevin mentioned, you know, we don't want to rush. I, I recognize as I'm, my title is corporate relations manager, but I advise students in the full-time program. We have split roles in our office. And I certainly acknowledge that students get exposed to things during the course of the program, particularly early, that are going to influence the decisions that they make um, in, their, in their internship and post-MBA choices. From our, from our program, we primarily see uh, students enter consulting, um, very typical, and then uh, the technology sector as well. And I would say that is generally um, product and program management roles, some technology strategy roles. Um, but we also see uh, students going into more traditional marketing or certainly operations management is an area that students focus in on at Georgia Tech, Scheller, and also, um, you know, the finance as well. Right. I And I should say um, another point I like to always make is that, you know, a business school is the only school uh, at a university that teaches students professional skills, professional development. Mm -hmm. You know, go and major or get a graduate degree in any other field and you will not be told how to make a persuasive presentation. You will not be told how to work successfully in a diverse team. 
and you will not be told how to clearly and succinctly communicate uh, issues in, in a way that make people listen to you. And this is what a great business school education does. And it does start, in fact, with uh, a careers curriculum of one kind or another. And Caroline, I wonder if you might uh, just talk a little bit about the careers curriculum at Scheller. We actually begin, much like some of the others have mentioned, um, our career preparation for particularly for our full time students in the summer before um, they they begin our program. So we are reaching out to our um, our full time students, particularly in the uh, late spring, early summer. We have adjusted to actually beginning some of our virtual programming with them, um, what I would say the basics, um, in, in the month of June. Um, students are getting their assigned advisors um, to um, work with through the extent of the program right from the get-go. And students will interact, will meet with their advisors right from um, early uh, summer on through uh, their internship search and their job search. So it really is very much like a partnership. Um, we devote I mentioned some of that June programming virtually. We devote half of our orientation, which is two weeks, to uh, exclusively career-focused curriculum where we are doing uh, panels that help them to kind of focus in on career paths. Um, we are having them work interactively with each other to uh, polish their resumes, to develop interviewing skills with our practitioners who are coming in. And then we continue that curriculum on Friday afternoons throughout the fall semester, where we are building on that basic content um, with more refinement of networking, how they might use um, multi-pronged job search, and, and, and continuing to connect with alumni of our program who can be influential in kind of how they form themselves as professionals, but also um, it, great in connections with our community. Do you have one-on-one -on -one coaching or mentoring as well? We do. We actually have um, that one-on-one -on -one coaching with our advisees throughout the time we're in the program. So our students with that assigned advisor relationship are, are certainly interacting with us regularly. We go through required qualifying interview processes. So we advise our students um, to meet with us more than once a month. But Kevin, let me go to you. Uh, give us a sense of uh, the career curriculum at Fisher. Uh, so somewhat similar to what Caroline talked a little bit about with Georgia Tech, literally from the time that the folks are admitted into the program, uh, they start working with our office in career management. And we have what we call a career core. And our career core starts over the summer and it's built on online uh, modules through Canvas that many of us use. And students complete different segments and different modules, complete resumes, LinkedIn profiles, elevator pitches, so that they are working with the Office of Career Management staff so that we're kind of getting them to almost what I would call a baseline of different career information so that when they hit the ground on campus and sometimes early August to mid-August, they're at a certain baseline where we can continue to take off with them. So we have what will soon be a two-week uh, kind of a co career orientation or an MBA orientation for our students, getting them acclimated to the cities. We get them to the city of Columbus and the metropolitan area and getting them around and showing them hot spots and cool places, uh, fun things for them to do uh, during that two weeks. We also take them to companies that are, that's a big advantage that, that we have in a larger metropolitan area from the Fortune 500 companies that are right here in our backyard where we can take these excursions and start getting them exposure. And I, what I'd call exploring earlier. Do I want insurance? Do I want banking? JP Morgan Chase is right here in our backyard, Cardinal Health and a number nationwide and others that we utilize to again, get students start thinking about careers, not so much pushing them, but again, exploring them from, from that perspective. Then after they start their classes, we also have a seven week, what I would call intense, career class, what we call our career management class. And that's where we're bringing in alumni that are co-presenting with our Office of Career Management staff on a certain topic. 
at giving the students an opportunity to connect with a uh, recruiter in a specific area and being coached and educated on technical interviews, case interviews, behavioral interviews, evaluating compensation package, that sort of thing. But what I really think, and, and Caroline touched on this a little bit, what I really think is probably the most unsung thing of, of, of any of the offices it is really our one-on-one -on -one coaching. That's where I believe that secret sauce that we have, where you get to meet one-on-one -on -one with a person on our staff that is really kind of helping shepherd you through the process. And I think that's such a, a, a big perk that uh, I, I know we do, but I know others as well, but uh, a nice advantage for students. Mary, since you're the Director of Career Coaching at Mendoza, I wonder if you might give us some insight into how coaching works for an MBA student. I mean, um, when you sit down with someone, what, what are the kinds of things that you're discussing? What kind of guidance are you providing? Yes, and I think that um, I, I always joke when I talk about our career process, we have a very similar seven-week course structure. And I see people at the end of me explaining it, they're like ready for the, the what's next. And the line I always use is that it's a choose your own adventure. Because at the end of that seven week course, you have some people who are still very much within the discernment process. And those career coaching conversations look like a lot of, of probing and open ended questions for students to help discern their own motivation, skill set, marketplace fit. And we use some external tools to help with that as well to be able to say, hey, what, uh, what did you learn about yourself through some of these career assessments? Um, what are you motivated by? How do you see that market fit? You could also, in the exact same day, have a student that had done a lot of discernment, came into the program knowing exactly what they want to do, but they want to focus on telling their story and how they pitch themselves in a really compelling way. So instead of that kind of probing question, coaching conversation, it's much more around how do you take your skill sets and your new knowledge of the marketplace that you got through our career leadership course and turn it into a really compelling pitch? Uh, it could look like a mock interview where you are working with a coach to uh, get your interview prep skills ready for specific industries. Um, so I've worked with students who are, are going into that Amazon interview and they want to know from us how to approach their 16 leadership principles. And we can kind of share those, those insights from alums all the way through negotiation and thinking about both the data side of things in terms of a comp package, but also the discernment of what's the right fit for them. So I give those examples. I, I could have probably had a, a day that looked just like that as a, as a coach within the last couple of years, but it really does depend on where the student is within their journey uh, and where, where they are looking to either discern or prepare for their market facing kind of experiences. So you you get quite a bit within that career one-on-one -on -one coaching. And it's a, again, a choose your own adventure. That's quite a detailed look at what you get uh, because believe me, uh, you don't get any of that at other colleges um, <laughs> that are outside of the business arena. I mean, imagine how you would address all of the 16 principles Amazon is looking for in a candidate <laughs> or preparing for a, a rigorous case interview at a top consulting firm. I mean, these are the kinds of things that are just almost impossible to get and you wouldn't do it yourself. Uh, and really they open up many doors. Carly, uh, give us a sense of the career development work that you're doing at Florida Warrington. Sure. I'll try to report out by exception because um, we do offer several of the uh, same approaches that the other schools have mentioned. Um, I will say, uh, and, and possibly you guys are experiencing this too, um, this careers curriculum question used to kind of be around, okay, how do you get students ready for when they start interacting with employers? But I, I think recently I've had to get, we, we've all had to get a lot comfortable or a lot more comfortable with interactions with employers start at the very beginning. So rather than <laughs> here's all this preparation <laughs> stuff that we do to get them ready for when we allow employers to start interacting, it's much more prep, preparation, execution, preparation, ex execution, because you have things like you know, P and Q networking festival, jumpstart employers at orientation as we have. And so um, it becomes less about, hey, let's get everybody ready to the pinnacle of readiness and then and then start interacting with employers. So I, I would argue, and, and I think Kevin, you mentioned this with the with the company visits, part of that 
um, preparation is now getting feedback from probably some of your closer employers, employers who might feel more comfortable giving you feedback on students early. Um, but that's something that's really, I think, changed over the last three or four years. I'll add that um, we do offer onboarding um, programs during the summer. We offer both asynchronous through Canvas, as almost everybody else is doing. But very recently, we've opened up some uh, live onboarding sessions that extend across the graduate school. So they have a chance to inter interact even with specialized master's students and go to specific sessions over the summer. And if they hit all those deliverables, they really start their MBA career with a, a medalist ceremony after a, a summer sprint where our executive uh, director you know, meets and greets those students who really put in the time before uh, classes in the summer. Um, I'll, I'll just add similar to others that our careers uh, component of orientation is significant. In fact, uh, at Florida, it takes up the most time of, of any of the other content at orientation. So I think the students are really well equip equipped probably across our universities uh, by the time class comes around to understand that, it, that class itself is only part of part of the equation for the MBA. Yes. If I, if I could jump in yeah, and, and help you uh, with, with a comment on the preparation and execution all that we we call that we're building the bicycle as we're riding it we, we would love to back in the old days we used to open the floodgates and it's like before that we're preparing preparing okay now we're ready now the companies and the employers are dictating that we need the access to these people as quickly and so it's a matter of we're constantly preparing them but we're riding the bicycle as we're doing that and again that's okay and we tell that to the students and the employers but that's on us to kind of be letting them know how the how the new process is working. Yeah, and only yesterday I spoke to an MBA alum who said the biggest surprise of the program was how quickly employers were interested in her. Uh, you know, employers just can't wait uh, to see what the new talent is uh, coming into the business schools. And people are flattered by their interest because they've never seen that before. They've always been on the other end of this where they're begging to get in and get an interview or get someone to talk to. And now suddenly um, you have all these really big respect, respected and admired employers coming after you simply because you just joined an MBA program. And uh, this is just a testament to the, the open door policy that many companies have and the demand for MBAs. Carly, what do you think employers most appreciate about your MBA graduates? Yeah, th this is tough. So I think there are a couple of things. Um, one, there's a certain, you've heard me say this before, John, there's a certain grit mentality that I think our, our students uh, yeah. bring to the table. We really like to compete for some of those top spots at firms that traditionally have held most of their um, roles for, for target schools. And so um, like a lot of uh, schools, we uh, benefited from some of the virtual recruitment that flowed out of um, you know, post COVID programming. Um, but I think it's, it's grit. Um, it's that team mindset. I think our students also, if I can get, you know, a little bit more granular, I think our students tend to present well, just because of the emphasis that we put on, uh, case competitions. We, we bring in an alum every year to train on PowerPoint. Uh, we work with a particular, uh, business improv vendor to get them really comfortable on their feet. So I think, um, you know, the, our, our students are fairly articulate and post internship, we always have our uh, two year students come back and say that, Hey, I, I saw a, a, an example deck floating, floating around at my firm. And I noticed that it was a Florida student. And then we'll have, you know, a neighboring student say the same thing, only that the, the example decks that were circulated were from Florida. So I think we have, um, we're, we're fairly well known for hopefully being able to put in, into the marketplace folks who can, you know, come up with a strategic idea and present it, present it well. So Mary, what about the Mendoza MBA? What do employers most appreciate about your graduates? Yes, I think that uh, outside of the, the technical skills that are required and also the executive presence uh, that Mendoza students bring that we really focus on is really a focus on the team and a focus on curiosity for how to make things better, which comes from that growing the good in business. We have a real focus on problem solving and business judgment and being able to ask those probing questions to, to improve the organization that they are in. And I think that focus on on continuous growth of good, but also 
business problem solving and trying to make the team that you're on better through a sense of servant leadership and really um, excellent business skills is something that that differentiates our students and, and makes people want to come back and, and find more of that talent. I think there's also a really a, a really key component to our culture at Mendoza, but at the university as well, of a sense of service and giving back. So when you are on a team, making sure that you are giving back um, and you see that with our students, with the communities that they work with, that the projects that they work on. And we know that employers really appreciate that sense of service and growing the good. Yep. Kevin, what's your take on that question? Well, I, I immediately thought of, you know, Carly and and mentioning the grit. And I was like, oh, she got to go first. And she took the, <laughs> my answer because that's that's what I was thinking of, you know, because I, I do think that the OSU Fisher student is a type of student that I, I often will say has been beaten up in the streets a little bit. And it's like, hey, they, they, they come from the real world and they've seen what it's like. And I think now probably the biggest thing is they come with a, a level of professional polish that mm-hmm. that that they have accumulated. And I think that some of that professional polish comes from uh, the way our curriculum is set up with the flexibility, as well as the exposure to so many different areas. And I think that the curriculum flexibility has given them again, I, the exposure to different areas so that when they do get uh, in front of a company, they, they're they ready to go and whatever they throw at them, they've, they've had that ops class, they've had that supply chain, the marketing, the brand manager, the product development, they've had that. So uh, between their exposure and kind of been beaten up in the streets, they're a little tougher. We hope they're as professionally polished as they possibly can be. And again, they're, they're really ready for anything. So I think those would be things that I would highlight with Fisher. Caroline, are your MBAs ready for anything? <laughs> they are ready for anything. I would. I wanted to highlight the um, the the ten practicum courses. First of all, that we uh, invite students, encourage students to participate in during the practicum. I really do think that those practical applications of the concepts that they're learning in the coursework they're taking is a real differentiator. And especially for many, we have students come into our program from a wide variety of backgrounds. It gives students the special. Um, opportunity to be in a situation that is very similar to one that they would enter post-graduation. So consulting with clients, advising employers that they may ultimately be going after. um, I think that really does help to cultivate some of the skill in their communications, in their presence. Um, Certainly as they're working on these teams, the collaboration that they are gaining, maybe even if they hadn't had that similar work environment coming in. um, I think, again, we could really stand on our analytical ability, and that's learned through the courses um, that that students are taking and the ability to take um, data and translate that into actionable strategy. Strategy and innovation is one of the most popular concentrations we have, and I think that that, um, that ability to take the technical skills and data and distill it down to actionable strategy is a real advantage as something that our employers appreciate about our students. Yeah. Let me uh, also say that, you know, years ago, my generation found a job by looking at one ads. And maybe this generation will look at LinkedIn uh, possibilities. But the truth is that most people who get professional white collar jobs today uh, do not respond to white uh, want ads and very few people uh, connect uh, through those old mechanisms of how to find a job. And one of the things that all of you do exceptionally well is teach people how to get a job through smart networking, uh, through leveraging your alumni connections, Uh, and doing the kinds of things that discover positions that otherwise are invisible to most people. And so, Caroline, I wonder if you might uh, talk a little bit about your alumni network, how engaged it is with the school, and how helpful it is uh, in helping your students find jobs. 
Sure. And I've actually worked at Georgia Tech for the most part since 2007. And I will say the Georgia Tech community overall is an incredibly welcoming and supportive alumni environment. And I would say that just takes down to the scale of the MBA program very perfectly in that the size of our programs are, are appropriate so that students get to know one another. They get to know uh, the professors. They get to know the career advisors. They get to know the programs office professionals. And I think that that creates an especially warm bond with Scheller College of Business. And our uh, alumni, I mentioned we have um, them involved in our orientation through panels. This year, they, there was an entirely alumni-driven case competition during our, our orientation. We are, we are matching our students one-to-one -one for you know, networking conversations, but they're also participating as mentors. Alumni are participating as mentors um, to our students, and they're also working at the companies that our students are interested in uh, right here in Atlanta, right? So we have so many of our very large employers that are right around the corner from our building represented. So that can be great for information gathering and certainly connections as impact uh, the job search too. Kevin, you already spoke about the loyalty and passion of the Buckeye nation. <laughs> um how do you engage your alumni in, in helping your uh, more recent graduates? Yeah, it's it's a great question. And, and probably the easiest thing that I tell our students that they have to do is just talk to people. That's that's literally all I'm asking you to do. <laughs> and, and because, you know, we have about 100,000, you know, living alumni of, of, of Buckeyes and that are all across the globe, and some of them are so willing to give back. And I'll, I'll give you a couple quick examples of, of one, uh, a company who's uh, working in Silicon Valley with a, a big four firm. And they're like, hey, I, I'm, I'm a partner out here in San Jose, and I'd love to get more Buckeyes out here on the West Coast. Uh, I would happen to be at a networking event last night, and somebody was a uh, Fisher MBA alum and had previous military where they did their undergrad at West Point. And they wanted to give back and connect more with our MBA veterans that were in our program. Uh, you know, we have somebody that called me recently in, in Boston that was a chief investment officer. And it's like, hey, I'm not sure if you're one of our core schools or target schools. I, I don't have any clue. All I know is we have these opportunities and I wanted to make sure that we connect you with you. You know, we use a, a technology for our students called Alumni Fire, a corporate mentor program where we ask our alumni to go in and to uh, be willing to connect with our students. Our students, when they come through our orientation program, they then join this Alumni Fire uh, website where they can reach out and connect. So it's similar to LinkedIn, which our students use as well, but it's something specifically just for OSU. And again, it's for our full-time MBA uh, students as well as our working professionals or our part-time. So it's a great advantage. And that's one of, again, the beauties of the big OSU network. Yeah, that's great. I know Notre Dame obviously has an incredibly strong alumni network as well. Can you speak to it? Yes, absolutely. And I, I'm I'm what we call a double domer. I I went to Notre Dame for my undergrad. Double domer. We got the dome. Uh, went to Notre Dame for right. my undergrad. Went to Google for a few years. And when when I told people I was going back to the same school that I got my undergrad in, they said, well, "Why not go somewhere else?" And my answer was. Uh -huh. I've already seen that this works and I've seen what the Notre Dame alumni network does for me. And so I'm choosing to, to continue to be a part of that. So that's my own, my own personal anecdote around the alumni network, but we have 266 active alumni clubs across the globe for the university of Notre Dame. One of the great parts of Mendoza is that you are not just a Mendoza alum, you are a Notre Dame alum and you can really feel that with the way that uh, undergraduate alums, other other programs alums interact and support each other. Um, we obviously have quite a bit of alumni interaction coming back to campus, but also some of those offsite opportunities. We're about to kick off our annual Silicon Valley mod away where we have students that are studying in Silicon Valley, and we have an alumni advisory group for that. So people who are out in the Bay Area that have dedicated their time to working with our students while we're there. 
our corporate advisory board. We have a lot of a lot of alumni advisory boards. If you give people a party to go to, to to bring them together and share that information, it's it's really helpful. So we have our corporate advisory group that really helps our students and advocates for them across various different pathways. And then we also have a great networking platform called Irish Compass, which allows students and alumni to interact and find each other based on uh, whether it's geographic location, areas of interest, and then also groups where people can learn about different areas. So things like the Notre Dame Tech Forum are really good ways for both the school, the students, and alumni to come together on specific topics and share their resources. So it's it's quite an active uh, family that we have here within the Notre Dame Alumni Network. And obviously, you don't have to be Irish to uh, take advantage of it. <laughs> exactly. We are, Our orientation is uh, called Becoming Irish. So but at the end of it, everyone, everyone <laughs> Everyone's here is Irish. Irish. At the end, yes. Everyone's Irish around here in South Bend. And, and Carly, can you talk a little bit about the Florida um, Alumni Network? Happy to. I, I could gush for hours about support from, from our alumni. I, I will just say a couple of things, though. Um, one, I think Florida might stand out a little bit from the other programs mentioned in that we're actually kind of late to the structured platform uh, game when it comes for alumni. Um, and that's just because the need hasn't really been there due to the responsiveness of our alum on LinkedIn and, and, you know, other, you know, more organic platforms, our, our Gators really jump at the chance to give back to particularly MBAs. And so we've been doing quite well in some of the, you know, more organic connections. Um, a lot of our alumni interactions does happen in and around uh, sporting events. And I've brought that up a couple of times, but our homecoming weekend is this weekend. We're expecting about 700 RSVPs just to our MBA tailgating events. So it's, that's a really good place for our uh, full-time and our professional students and alumni to meet one another. Um, just a real quick anecdote from, from last week, we have, a uh, firm who recently named UF as a target school uh, come to campus, you know, sponsor an event and a happy hour as they do uh, at most of your schools, I'm sure. But I realized sitting in the back of the room that all four presenters uh, were alumni of the full time MBA program. UF. And so um, we definitely are overrepresented in some of these firms based on the size of our program. And um, the alumni, you know, loyalty, I think, is also pretty evident in the fact that, you know, similar to, to Mary, I, I came back to work for my alma mater just because of um, the indebtedness I felt to particularly the Career Services Office for helping to transform my career. So I'm a UF MBA alum as well. And, um, you know, had that really personal experience and, and most students do who complete our program and they're very happy to to share their uh, network and their perspective with current students. Great. Let me just say, after spending this time with all of you, uh, I'm more confident than ever um, that you have the backs of your students, that you're in their corner uh, and that I think that's uh, that's an incredible advantage to have in the world of work, which is as often as chaotic and as changing as ever, with uh, AI becoming a major factor uh, in the near future, if not already, uh, and with the ups and downs of the economy. I mean, I think that an MBA and having the support of people like yourself uh, makes a very big difference in one's career. So Carly, Mary, Kevin, and Caroline, thank you so much for being with us today. Really appreciate it. And for all of you out there, thanks for watching our Center Court session on MBA careers. This is John Byrne with Poets and Quads.